Hey guys, so we want to find a way to measure when we as a society have built something good. How do we know that we've made a successful society? Who do we count? How do we count? How do we measure this thing? So let's, uh, let's introduce a few different ways to do that. Broadly, this would fall under the field of welfare economics. If you've taken your introductory uh, microeconomics class, you probably remember a couple concepts called consumer and producer surplus. These come to us from the field of welfare economics. We're trying to measure the best way to allocate resources in the economy. And we're trying to measure how well off people are, trying to measure welfare. Yeah, there you go, welfare economics. This is very related to the idea of utility. This is the benefit that people get from consuming goods and services. And let's remember from our discussion of uh, kind of modern utilitarian thought, the idea of diminishing marginal utility. The more and more and more you get, the less additional utility you get per unit, right? So for example, if you know the first thousand dollars I make is worth way more to me than the thousandth thousand dollars that I make, if that makes sense, right? Diminishing marginal utility. As we look at how we want to set up and measure our successful society, maybe we should keep in mind Vilfredo Pareto's social utility rule, and that is that we should do things if at least one person is made better off and no one is made worse off. If at least one person is made better off and nobody else is made worse off, we should definitely do that thing. If we follow this, our policy prescriptions, our economic allocations will always help people. But obviously, I mean, is, are there a lot of things that do help someone and at least don't hurt anybody else? Everything comes with trade-offs. If we're going to provide some service, say, to the poor, that's probably going to have to come at the cost of you know, somebody else's wealth. Uh, maybe. But if we can ever find these kind of Pareto uh, transactions that benefit everybody, we should do them. Yes, good. All right, we'll put that in the back of our heads. So today we're looking at social welfare functions. And again, the idea here, welfare as in well-being, measuring the well-being of people in our society, welfare here not to mean this, the idea of you know, government aid to the poor, the way we commonly associate that word welfare. So we're trying to calculate how good is our society? How do we measure a successful society? First, we're going to look at Jeremy Bentham. So this is our utilitarian measure of social welfare. So to put it now, uh, I know we put some, oh, we got a little bit of math on the board. Run away. No, no, no. You guys can handle this. So we put it in kind of a mathematical notation. So this is our utilitarian social welfare function. The total utility of a society is equal to the sum of individual utility for however many people in that exist in your society. So we add up all of the net utility, remember this idea of pleasure minus pain, we add up everybody's utility and that total number represents our society's utility. So we want to maximize total utility in our society Remembering that there is diminishing marginal utility, so if we can help out the people with the least, that will benefit our total utility more than helping out people that already have a lot. So the utilitarians might say, hey, look, we need to add up as much utility as we can, and that's the, the best thing we can do. Maybe we see a problem with this, which is, okay, first of all, how do you measure that? How do you measure personal utility might be a little tricky, but there you go. That's what Bentham has to say. The philosopher John Rawls. John Rawls creates the maximin criterion. That is maximin, not maximum. He believes we ought to make 
The goal of society be to help the, per help the people that are in the worst situations. So to say this in a mathematical notation kind of way, Rawls social welfare function, Rawls measurement of the you know, utility a society creates would be the measurement of whoever has the least, the minimum utility in our society. We find the people that are hurt most. We want to help them out of that situation. That is the way to measure a successful society, according to John Rawls. Well, why is he saying this? In his book, A Theory of Justice, the modern political philosopher John Rawls, he argues, if you could imagine the before life, you guys have heard of the afterlife, that's where you go after you die. What about the before life? Before you're born, you're just a spirit in the void waiting to be zapped into your body, and you're talking with all the other spirits. You don't know if you're going to be born rich or poor or black or white or what religion or where geographically. You just know you're about to be born, and you're talking about how you best would want to set up society. John Rawls argues that behind this veil of ignorance, he calls it, behind this veil of ignorance where I don't know where I'm going to end up, I would probably want to help out people in the worst possible situation. So again, in his book, A Theory of Justice, John Rawls says, from behind the veil of ignorance, we would set up a society that helps the least of these, that helps the poorest among us. Famous Indian economist, uh, Amartya Sen. Sen believes that if you want to measure how well off a society is, you need to take into account a couple things. First, per capita income. And second, income inequality. So for Amartya Sen, the utility of the society is a function of per capita income and income inequality. Here we use the Gini coefficient, which is a measure of income inequality. Basically what he's getting at is you want a rich society, but if those riches are so concentrated in the hands of the absolute wealthiest, well then, you've really not got a successful society. Because you've got a handful of people doing really well, but you're not taking into account everybody. So he says, we want average income with some accounting for income inequality. So what is this Gini coefficient? Well, this heat map shows us the Gini coefficients of all these different countries. And you can see where the darker colors are. That is where income inequality is worse in the world. So we see the least income inequality over here in Eastern Europe, Scandinavia, fairly low in Western Europe, a little higher in South America, Central America, and the United States, very high in South Africa. Uh, South Africa really off the charts in terms of income inequality. Figured you guys would find this interesting. Let's introduce a fourth and final way of measuring social welfare. How good are we doing as a society? The United Nations has the Human Development Index, the Human Development Index, HDI. So this is a macroeconomic social welfare function, and they include a few different things. So the HDI is a function of life expectancy, educational attainment, and income. So they create an index out of these variables. Life expectancy, educational attainment, and income. So we got a few different ways of measuring social welfare, right? Maybe this one's pretty good. 
Yeah, these are things we can actually measure. Maybe a successful society is one where people live a long time, that are well educated, and they have money. And maybe we don't want to place too much emphasis on one or the other. Maybe just looking at income or just looking at life expectancy would leave a lot out. So maybe we look at a combination of these variables. So just to reiterate, we talked about utilitarian, Rawlsian, Amartya Sins, and the UN's different ways of measuring successful societies. We call these social welfare functions. But the story doesn't end there. Even, even if we pick one of these, how are we defining society? Are we just going with country? Historically, there have been a lot of different ways of defining your society. The group of people or person, yeah, so the person or group of people that you're saying, these are the people we're trying to take care of. Famously, the philosopher Ayn Rand says, look, your goal in life, your only moral purpose is your own happiness. And it's not, not to say this like radical hedonism, where you're just doing whatever feels good in the moment, but an enlightened self-interest, that's the only goal of your life. So you shouldn't care about other people, just care about yourself. When you measure a successful society, it's the one where you're doing the best. Philosopher Gary Becker says you should put more emphasis on family. Historically, there have been a lot of ethnocentric groups, groups of people that think it is our ethnicity, it's our clan that we want to further. We measure a successful society as the one that is advancing our ethnic interest. I give the example here of the, the Hutu tribe from Rwanda, or very famously some ethnocentric thinking from uh, Aryans in uh, the 20th century, right? So that's certainly led to some very, uh, very awful conflicts in the last few hundred years. Maybe we should define society as a town. Maybe, uh, you know, it's a city. You know, we should just measure how Bowling Green is doing and not care about other cities. Maybe, you know, this is the perspective of the city-states of yesteryear, the Spartans. Maybe we're from Boston. We only care about other people from Boston. Maybe we should define our society as a state. Just within our state borders, that's where we care to look. Most of the models that I've shown you guys, these social welfare functions, are calculated at the country level. Maybe we should just have the goal of making ourselves better off. Uh, our country is within our national borders. That's what we're trying to maximize, the social welfare of our country. This is certainly that kind of America first philosophy, right? We're not looking to make the world better off, we're looking to make our people better off. That's what our society should aim to do. Maybe we should broaden that, not just to include our country, but our country plus its allies. Maybe. Certainly lots of people believe in furthering the interest of their religious affiliates, Catholics wanting to further the interest of other Catholics. Uh, as you've heard the term Christendom, right? Um, certainly in the Muslim world, there's common threads where they want to advance common religious in interests. Uh, it's not every people of these different faiths, but this is, you know, there are certainly these are common things you will hear. Maybe we need to define society as humanity. Every person on the globe. We should measure everybody when we try and decide how to benefit society. We really need to try and decide how to benefit the world. Well, certainly that might be a good goal, but it might be hard to measure. It might be hard to achieve that. I hope you can see, even if we pick one of these social welfare functions, defining society might make it even harder. And it might get even harder than that. Are we, are we picking one moment in time to measure it? Or are we measuring these different social welfare functions over time? So I'll give you an example. 
if our goal was to maximize per person income and minimize inequality, so this is Amartya Sen, we're gonna take Sen's social welfare function, say we wanna maximize that social welfare function one month from today, that's the day we're gonna measure it. Well, if that's the day we're gonna measure how well off our society is, and we're trying to make it as high as possible, well, we could just give everybody 100K a year jobs, boost that income, lower that income inequality, and then after that day, we, oh, okay, everybody uh, go home, we ran out of money, don't worry about it anymore. Clearly this is something that we have to think about. So we gotta decide how we're gonna measure, then what people, where are we gonna measure, and then when are we measuring? One specific point in time or over time? So at first blush you might think, okay, yeah, measuring a successful society is easy. Clearly there's a lot going on here. Gets even harder than that. Do we look at people as a cross-section, considering people where they're at today? Or do we consider people over the course of their life how they'll be doing? I'll give you guys an example. Just a few years ago, I was in college, and by federal standards, I certainly would have been poor. I was, uh, give, the, give one year in particular, I was in grad school, I was married, I made $6,000 that year, hustling, maybe a little more than that, but I was just working part-time jobs, just trying to get by, and certainly by federal standards, I was poor. But now I'm doing a lot better, I've got a full-time job, got a baby, I feel better, not having to hustle quite as hard, doing things I enjoy, making better money, all this great stuff. If we measure my utility in that year, well, it was pretty low. Life kind of sucked, but I embraced the suck because I knew in the future there was something better coming from it. How do we take that into account? That some people are going to be poor temporarily on their way to something better. Oh my goodness. I hope you guys are seeing this whole measuring who our society is and how well they're doing is really tricky, especially when we add this element of time. But oh my goodness, let's add a whole other element. Should our goal to be to do any of this? Should the government's goal be to maximize income or maximize utility or to help the least of these or whichever of these social welfare functions? Or are all of these misguided? And the goal of the government shouldn't be to do any of that. The goal of the government needs to, maybe it just needs to protect our rights. Uh, what rights are those? Uh, Leave that up to you guys to figure out. Perhaps the ones outlined in the Constitution, maybe that's all the, the role of the government is. Maybe it's wrong-headed to say we should pursue making certain people better off or making everybody better off. We just need to achieve conceptual things. Justice, liberty, equality, maybe that should be our goal. I hope you can see from this video, wow, it is really hard to measure what makes a society successful. However, when you look around the world, or if you travel the world, you might know it when you see it. You might be able to recognize more or less successful societies, perhaps. Definitely gives you a lot to think about. All right.